Добро пожаловать в штаб квартире Бинков. Welcome to Binkov's headquarters. Battle between armor and tank guns has been going on for a century now. Where does current modern-day tank armor stand compared to the best anti-tank rounds out there, designed to defeat it? Since World War II, tank armor has progressed from simple slabs of steel to complex structures composed of several kinds of material. Equally so, the gun rounds have evolved from simple bullets and explosive rounds to a variety of shells, used for a wide range of purposes. Two round types have shown themselves as being useful against other tanks – sabotaged kinetic penetrators and rounds with shaped charge warheads. Shaped charges led the way initially, as their penetration ability did not depend on the velocity of the round. They have an explosive charge that is placed around a metal liner. Upon detonating, the explosive is focused to distort the liner into a thin jet of metal and push it forward at tremendous speed, cutting through the armor. The larger the round is, the greater effect it has. Modern high-explosive anti-tank rounds and missiles can usually punch through steel as thick as 7 to 10 times their diameter. But shaped charges fell out of favor through the Cold War. The optics and gun stabilization improved. Various sensors and computer control enable tanks to shoot from greater distances. Over time, hitting a tank from 2 kilometers away became standard, and heat rounds could not compete. They were large and not very aerodynamic, thus slow and suffering from ever-diminishing precision over such distances. Kinetic penetrators were preferred. While they did lose penetration ability over distance, their initial velocity meant they were quite precise. Modern-day kinetic penetrators are basically extremely durable arrows. They are very thin and aerodynamic, focusing their weight and velocity on the small point of their sharp nose as they punch into armor. They are also sabotaged, so the propellant has a larger area to push against. That way the arrow is fired out of the gun at highest possible speed. As it leaves the barrel, the sabo is discarded, so drag is minimized. Finally, fins are required for stable and precise flight, giving the round that arrow-like shape. Against a stationary target, the difference in precision isn't that great, and heat rounds are quite a bit used against such targets. But against a moving tank, APFSDS rounds are the norm. Heat round drops more over distance and is moved more by wind, requiring greater corrections in fire. In the end, it takes longer to reach a distant target. Against moving targets, that usually means no hit. So how do both heat and kinetic rounds kill? Basically, by damaging stuff inside tank and wounding or killing crew. Kinetic penetrator has no explosive and heat round's explosive charge is detonated outside the target. Both rounds do damage by sending bits and pieces of themselves and, more importantly, bits of armor breaking off into the tank. All those pieces fly around the vehicle, ricocheting and causing damage. The British have used the round design not to penetrate, yet sends shrapnel around the interior of the tank. It was effective against simpler armor, sending shockwave through it and making the inner walls break off. Newer composite armors propagate those shock waves much less, so today the round's use is generally relegated to structure demolition. Modern tanks have their interior walls lined with soft protective material, diminishing the effect and coverage of incoming fragments. Still, a penetrated tank is going to have a lot of fragments flying into it. Besides direct damage, fragments may hit stored propellant for gun rounds. If such a round is stored inside a crew compartment, it may lead to an explosion. Even without such an event, penetration will often cause some overpressure, injuring the crew. Sometimes it's strong enough to force open hatches from inside on an armored vehicle. The weaker the armor is, less deformation of the armor-piercing round will occur, leading to less deformation of the armor itself and less fragments flying around. That is called overpenetration. It is the reason why heat rounds are still preferred at times over kinetic penetrators against medium armor vehicles. Heat rounds jet disperses to a greater degree when punching through such armor. It may do more damage. When it comes to heavily armored targets, 
kinetic penetrators shear more upon breaking through and cause damage roughly similar to what the heat round would do. Heat rounds can actually cause less damage upon penetration if the armor made some of the jet dissipate, so only a fraction of it actually entered the inside of a tank. When one takes into account the fact kinetic penetrators are faster and thus more precise, and that armor can be made more effective against heat warheads, it is clear why APFSDS are rounds of choice for tank battles. As said, armor composition against heat can be more easily tailored against it, so in reality heat rounds have to punch through armor of even greater equivalent of thickness. Ways around the issue of lesser precision were sought. Soviets in particular relied on guided missiles fired from the main gun. Over time, such missiles got larger and better. Today's top Russian missile is Reflex. When fired, a sustainer rocket motor is engaged, getting the missile to its maximum effective range. The firing platform paints the target with a laser beam. The missile, upon being fired, corrects its flight so it always stays within the beam, even if the firing platform moves it, so it can better track a moving target. The system provides high precision. A simple gun rounds could hardly hit anything beyond 4 km. At 5 km, even a stationary target would be seldom hit, with the trajectory drop, wind, gun barrel and round imperfections. Still, against frontal tank armor, such missiles will not yield a kill most of the time, but flanking attacks or attacks against other targets can be devastating from such distances. Said missile is also useful against slow helicopters, US uses an unguided general-purpose round against helicopters, though it cannot compete with the guided missile. Still, any sort of hit to the outside of the tank can be dangerous. Gun barrel, sights and other sensors may get damaged, degrading tank's ability to fight back. Even tracks may get broken and immobilize the tank. Furthermore, to hit something, one has to see it. Moving object will be spotted much more easily moving object will have a greater heat signature, but at the same time, moving object will be harder to hit. Protection comes in two varieties, active, not getting hit, and passive, surviving a hit. Active protection can be anything from tactics, using the surroundings to hide oneself from view, or shield oneself from a hit. Certain parts of the tank, those close to the ground, are less likely to get hit, because tank commanders will try to get in hull down positions if surroundings allow it, hiding their lower halves behind natural cover. Moving towards enemy, however, makes seeking cover very hard. Tanks will use smoke screens and flares to obstruct enemy's aim. Previously, Russian tanks used infrared jammers, basically emitters that would blind enemy's sights. More modern sights are immune to that, so newest Russian tanks dispensed with such jammers. Another last line of active defense are active protection systems. They use radar sensors to detect incoming threats. Then the tank fires projectiles into that threat. Israel is the most prolific user of such systems today. A tiny number of their systems is used on US Abrams tanks. Russian army is also testing their systems. Downside of such APS was inability to deal with high-speed kinetic penetrators. Today, they are geared against anti-tank missiles and rockets, but developmental systems such as ADS and Afghanit have shown some capability even against kinetic penetrators. When it comes to tank armor, the bottom line is, not everything can be equally armored, otherwise tanks would weigh over 100 tons. Usually, millimeters of protection equivalent of steel are used for measuring armor's effectiveness. In reality, there are too many variables to make a precise measurement system. All the figures publicly available for tanks made with complex armors, including ones in Binkov's videos, are just estimates. One kinetic penetrator may do better against one armor, but worse against other, even if former has more armor thickness equivalent, just because the latter was tailor-made to defeat that specific penetrator. As a general rule of thumb, most frontal surfaces are heavily armored, enough to stop most threats. Other surfaces are much less protected. It could be noticed that the crew will get most protection. A hit to the engine compartment is not something that is worth protecting against. That's because the tank will never be alone. If one stops moving, the rest of the army will go on fighting 
and the crew can simply get out. It all comes down to doctrine and planned use. Tanks are designed with the idea that they will be able to present their frontal side to the enemy. Today, demands of the urban warfare also made the sides well protected. Though that protection is usually reserved against shape charges and is often in add-on form, its extra weight would be a burden in tank-on-tank -tank battles. Modern top attack missiles have also made roof protection more important. Israeli Merkava 4 is a good example of an all-around armored tank, at some expense of frontal protection, all stemming from Israeli needs and perceived threats. Add-on armor plates started appearing in numbers in 1980s. It is not a coincidence that first ones to use it were Israel and Soviet Union. They were both faced with the prospect of countless guided anti-tank missiles with shaped charges. A team of soldiers could more easily hide and engage a passing tank from the side, or a helicopter could more easily engage tanks flanking them. Anti-tank missiles with shaped charge warheads were so much more numerous in numbers that they became the highest threat, and so the tank armor was in large part devised to deal against them. Those armors were explosive reactive armors, and they were really good against shaped charges. Armor against such rounds tends to be voluminous, but not as heavy as armor against kinetic penetrators. Still, tanks can hardly be 5 meters wide and remain practical. So side armor is still pretty flimsy in comparison to the frontal armor. Tiles are placed over the tank. They contain armor plates and explosive, sandwiched between them. It's crucial that the tiles are positioned at an angle to the most likely threat direction. When a projectile hits the tile, the explosive pushes the armor plates away. In this example, front plate is pushed against the incoming penetrator or shaped charge penetration jet. At the same time, the plate is pushing upwards at tremendous speed. Not only is it continuously feeding more armor into projectile's path, but it is also causing dissipation of shaped charge's jet, greatly reducing its focus and thus penetration ability. Back plate is doing the same, only downwards, as it moves away from the projectile but early ERA tiles were fairly light and not useful against kinetic penetrators. Later variants use multiple heavier plates. They cause the kinetic penetrator arrows to either change course or even break apart. In response, US rounds became thicker and heavier to withstand those forces and punch through. After latest Russian reactive armors, US switched to breakable penetrators. Instead of breaking without control and transferring force to the rest of the projectile, the frontal part breaks off along a pre-designed point as reactive armor tile is spent, leaving a sharp remainder of the projectile. Soviets had a literal two-part penetrator, where first penetrator would shatter the initial armor without passing on the stress onto the second penetrator. Perhaps a more famous multiple penetrator usage is found in tandem warhead-shaped charges. The initial smaller charge activates the reactive armor, and the larger charge can then deal with the armor behind it. More and more layers in modern armor have led to development of three-stage shaped charges where possible. End result of reactive armor tiles is fairly low weight of armor for a lot of protection equivalent. But once a tile is activated, that area is without any real added protection. So several shots onto Russian T-80 or T-90's front may lead to one of them hitting an area with a spent tile. If that happens, basic armor remaining is likely going to be defeated. Important to note, most tanks today have reactive armor of a sort, even if it doesn't have explosives. It's not as good against penetrators as explosive armor, but it can withstand multiple hits better. Basically, multiple plates of armor are placed at a certain angle, and rubber-like material is placed between them. When plates are hit, the material compresses and then has nowhere to go but expand. The plates then move in a similar fashion as with explosive armor, only the movement is much less pronounced, and thus such armor is not as effective, weight-wise. Still, most tanks use it in some form. Western tanks use voluminous armor more, placing layers of reactive armor, empty gaps, perforated steel armor and various composites. Silica-based glass-like armor was especially popular with Soviet tanks, as are ceramic plates with Western tanks. Pockets filled with silica are good against shaped charges. Ceramic plates are not only extremely hard, 
deforming the penetrator, which is good against kinetic rounds, but are brittle. As they break, their leftover jagged surfaces help dissipate the shaped charge jet stream and unfocus it. Very dense and strong materials, such as depleted uranium, have also been used as armor plating in tanks. But perhaps their more known use is for kinetic penetrators. Most countries today make their penetrators from either tungsten or depleted uranium. The latter is sometimes preferred, as it has other better properties. Compared to tungsten, it deforms less. Rather, it shears upon impact, leaving a sharpened tip as it progresses through armor. Lastly, the gun itself is an important piece of the puzzle. To give as much velocity to the round as possible, the propellant case should be as big as possible. Large caliber is usually better, though so far neither west nor east have went for really large calibers. The cumbersome large shells would require tanks to be even bigger and carry even less rounds in them. German Leopard 2 tanks use tungsten-based penetrators. To make up for the material, their guns use longer barrels. Greater pressure means higher muzzle velocities for their rounds. The battle between gun and armor, or better said, advanced gun rounds and complex defense solutions has been going on for decades and will continue. Neither of the two seems to be winning right now, leaving training and other aspects of tank battles equally important in deciding the outcome. Thanks for watching. If you liked my video, subscribe to my channel. And if you really like my videos, you can even support my work via Patreon. Also, check out my website for polls, video suggestions and my store, offering some cool t-shirts, mugs and other stuff. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.